So, hi everyone and welcome to another lecture of Cryptanalysis. And uh, today we're actually planning quite a jump in topics because what, we, what we've been looking at so far was mostly techniques from asymmetric cryptography. So we were looking at things like well-known hard problems, complexity theoretic problems, um, as well as some applications uh, of the tools that we saw there, like lattices for other things. And today we want to make the jump to symmetric cryptography. And we're going to do this um, by looking at one of the major uh, cryptanalysis techniques that we know in symmetric cryptography, namely differential cryptanalysis, which you've already heard a tiny bit about in um, last year's cryptography, but we will also be spending at least uh, two lessons uh, on this topic in cryptanalysis, where we'll see a lot more details than we've uh, heard before, including more information on how to exploit the things we find, um, how actually to find them in an automated way using tools, and many more topics. Um, so the plan for today is the following. Uh, since this is the first lecture on symmetric cryptography, I want to first recap a bit um, some general things we should uh, have in mind when analyzing symmetric cryptographic primitives like block ciphers. So I just want to recall some terminology here, some pictures to remind you all what we are talking about. Then we want to look um, at the basic definition of differential cryptanalysis and the notion of differences and characteristics. Um, we will then make uh, a brief intermezzo where we are going to have a look at tools that help us in this step here. So in finding, for example, good differential characteristics or in proving that no good differential um, characteristics exist, um, making it hard for an attacker to use this approach. Um, this is all going to be tied um, to concepts like the number of rounds that we have in a block cipher. So the topic or the question is again, how do we scale our cipher? How many rounds do we need to be secure? And in the last part, we want to talk a bit about how to actually exploit the things we have here. So how we can um, achieve actual attack goals like recovering a key or creating a hash collision using the stuff we've been talking about before. Uh, but before we do go into the details of today's lecture, um, I think it's time for another recap quiz. Um, this is a quiz about my last lecture, so the stuff you heard before the Easter break about lattices. Uh, so I do assume that uh, many of you will already have uh, uh, lost some of the details that we were talking about then, but this is a good um, opportunity to recall them. So we do have another quiz today. Um, I see a few people have already joined. So let's wait a few seconds until um, some more people are here. As usual, you can either use the number up there or the link in the video description. I think we should be approximately eight or nine, so maybe some of you haven't joined yet. Um, okay, uh, we have two animals joining, so uh, let's say that uh, this is a sufficient audience for a little quiz. And let's have a look at the first question. Um, this is uh, a question that involves a picture, which you will, should see both on the slides and on your phone and as usual mind the video latency. Oh, I didn't want to jump to the next question. Looks like this thing is a little confused. Okay, maybe it works now. Yes. So which of these three pictures actually shows a lattice? A, B or C? Excellent! All of you do have the correct answer. Um, maybe let's have a little look at why that is. Um, so probably some of you recognize this exact picture from the 
lecture, which indeed shows a two-dimensional lattice with two basis vectors, for example, this one here and this one here. Here we have some random garbage. And this here is a bit of a trick question because this is actually not one lattice, it shows two lattices. So we have one lattice which consists of these six points here in the middle of the others. And we have a second lattice which consists of essentially this um, grid here. But together they do not actually form a lattice because they don't contain all linear combinations of the basis vectors. Only the ones just from the first or just from the second lattice and not the mixed ones. Um, okay, but you all got that right, so I think we can go to the next question. And in the meantime, I will quickly hide to my computer because I think I forgot to include the leaderboard. Let's have a look at that in a moment. And in the meantime, you can have a look at the next question. Which of these is not a lattice problem? Okay, most of you got it right. Um, so indeed, the discrete logarithm problem is it is a complexity theoretic hard problem, but not a lattice problem. And one of the biggest and most important differences is that for lattice pro problems, we do not know fast quantum algorithms for the discrete log problem, we do. Um, so we have two uh, vector problems here, the shortest and the closest vector problem, which we did discuss in the previous lecture. And this one here, the uh, learning with errors, is a bit of a variant of the closest vector problem, which we didn't cover in detail, um, but just mentioned it briefly. Okay, but good job everyone. Let's have a look at the next one. So, which properties can change when you keep the same lattice, but you choose a different basis? Again, the majority is correct. Um, what does change is the length of the individual basis vectors, uh, or it can change. And this is actually something we need in cryptography. Uh, we will see in a moment why that is, or recall it in a moment. These two here are two invariant properties. They don't change. So the first one, the dimension, is essentially the number of basis vectors which does always stay the same, if the lattice stays the same. And the second one, the volume, if you remember, that was the area or the volume that is um, enclosed by the lattice uh, basis vectors. And this, even though the vectors can change, never changes. Um, uh, okay, so let's have a look at the next one. Which desirable properties does the LLM algorithm ensure? Again, great, good, uh, great work. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the things we do achieve is that we transform the basis into one that has mostly orthogonal or close to orthogonal um, vectors. So no narrow angles, but nearly orthogonal angles. Um, this one here, long basis vectors, is actually the opposite what, what, of what we want. What the LLL algorithm does is create shorter vectors. So it's the opposite of this one here and uh, the number of basis vector vectors stays unchanged. Okay, time for the last question. Oh, 
Oh no. Something went wrong. Let's try again. What exactly does the Bleichenbacher attack that you're also implementing in the exercise exploit? Oh, you don't agree on this one. Um, maybe it was not phrased so clearly. So the correct answer is that it exploits the fact that um, if we have a padding and if we have a wrong padding, there are error messages, this can leak information because it allows us to sort the messages into those with correct and those with incorrect padding. And in the case of RSA, this knowledge allows us to actually recover the underlying message if we can do this several times. Um, what's not correct is that it exploits a deterministic padding rule because actually the padding we are looking at includes randomness. So right after this initial prefix that we're interested in, there is a lot of garbage random bytes. Um, so this is something the padding we're looking at actually does correctly and Bleichenbacher doesn't exploit it. And uh, this answer here, a small RSA key size. Um, well, there is a slight influence of the key size on the complexity, but it's not so bad. And even the very secure RSA key sizes can easily be broken with Bleichenbacher's attack if you're using this bad padding, which gives you error messages. So if the implementation gives you error messages. Okay, let's have a look at the leaderboard, which hopefully will appear. Yes, it does. So it looks like our Ice Princess Elsa has won this one. Congratulations. Um, and thanks all for participating. Let's now have a look at the actual lecture content of today. So let's look at symmetric cryptographic primitives and how we analyze them. And what we actually mean by analyzing them. Uh, so a brief recap, what we're mostly looking at is block ciphers. So block ciphers are simple functions which take an input of a fixed size, a message block, and a key, a secret key. And based on this key, it defines some function that translates each message block to a ciphertext block of the same size in a bijective way. So you can encrypt and you can decrypt using this function. And um, for security, uh, there are a few main principles that we want to achieve. So some um, properties that this function is suppo supposed to satisfy. And the very classical phrasing of these properties is um, what uh, Claude Shannon phrased, namely uh, the principles of diffusion and confusion, where diffusion means more or less in a, a modern interpretation um, that the message and the information in the message. Um, so any individual bit here should influence all of the output. So it should quickly, the effect of one small difference should quickly um, propagate to the entire state and thus influence all of the ciphertext. And the second thing is that this uh, way of influencing should be complicated. Meaning, so the, the classical term for this is confusion. In other words, it shouldn't be a very simple relationship. Like, for example, um, this um, first bit here is uh, copied to all outputs or toggling this bit toggles all of the output bits. That would be a very simple behavior. We want it to be complicated so that it's hard to analyze for an attacker. And the usual way how we build a block cipher to achieve this is by doing a so-called key alternating construction which first means that um, we don't have one very large and complicated circuit, but we just define a simple circuit that is by itself not secure, but we repeat it many times. And each time it's influenced by the key. 
Um, this influence is um, guided by the key schedule, which simply blows up the key to more key material so that each round can be influenced by um, some function of the key. And in order to make this key influence the round, we actually simply XOR it between each round. This is what the key alternating construction suggests. This, um, this way of letting the key influence the operations. So that means the round functions are just very simple unkeyed functions, so they are publicly known. And by XORing the key and repeating this over and over, um, we get security by means of the so-called product cipher principle, which means uh, it takes simple steps and takes it to build something that is more secure than the individual components. And these components that we do have in here are typically the XOR of the round key here, plus two steps, a substitution step, um, which takes small blocks of the intermediate state and maps it with an S box to another block of the same size. So it um, replaces small blocks of this uh, state here. And the second step now mixes the effect of these individual substitutions. So this is the so-called permutation step or linear mixing step, where the effect of one S box is distributed to other S boxes um, in the state. We will have a clearer picture of this later, um, but for now I just want to recall these basic terms. Okay, so what do we actually want to achieve? How do we measure security? And there are two types of attacks that we're interested in, so-called generic attacks. These are attacks that only use the interface of a function. So um, for any block cipher, for example, which has the same dimensions, the same block size and key size, they will have the same complexity. So this gives us sort of upper bound for how secure something can be with these dimensions. And some of the generic things that you can do with a block cipher is you can try, for example, to guess the key. If the key size is k, then you will need approximately 2 to the power of k um, trial encryptions, one for each possible key candidate. Um, and if you have, for example, a known plain text cipher text pair that you can compare against, you can use this to find the correct key candidate. This is something you can do with any block cipher. Another thing you can do with any block cipher is you could simply write down the entire mapping. So if you somehow learn for each possible plain text block the corresponding cipher text block that it's translated to, in other words, if you learn the code book, so that's simply the mapping from plain text to cipher text, then um, you actually know everything there is to know about the block cipher. Uh, you don't even need to know the specific key because you have all the information you need. The key is just a compressed representation of this mapping. Another thing that works very often is distinguishing attacks, where you try to um, distinguish the behavior of the block cipher you have from, for example, a random function, which is not bijective. This is something that may become relevant whenever you use the block cipher in some mode of operation. And the way that this usually works is by looking whether after doing many translations from plain text to ciphertext, you do or do not observe collisions. In a bijective function, you will have never the same output twice, so no collisions. And in a random function, you will, after some time, randomly observe some collision. So these are generic attacks, and they form the baseline security. So our parameters must always be large enough for a reasonable security level at this point. So in particular, the key is usually at least 128 bits, so that key guessing is not feasible. And um, what we want to do is we want to build a block cipher, so build round functions, such that we cannot find any so-called dedicated attacks, which exploit the actual internal specification of the cipher and obtain an attack that is faster than the generic ones. This is our goal. So the round function should be uh, secure enough and repeated sufficiently often, such that anything we can do that uses information on this round function is no better than this stuff up here. So that's our goal. And while we will most of the time only talk about the complexity of doing something, 
you should always keep in the back of your mind that there are actually two parameters. If you have look at a specific attack, this attack has a complexity, but it also has a success probability with which it succeeds with this complexity. So for example, recall this picture here that we saw in cryptography. Uh, this shows, for example, um, the red line here shows um, the uh, security curve of guessing the key if you have an, uh, what is this, X, an X bit key. So for example, if you try all two to the power of X key candidates, you have a success probability of one. So you will definitely have the correct key among them. Um, if you only guess, for example, two to the power of um, X minus one here, then you have, of course, a 50% success probability because with 50% of cases, the correct key candidate will have been in the half of the set of all key candidates that you looked at and so on. And we will also see that this is the case in differential cryptanalysis. We will usually build attacks which have a complexity below the, um, the key complexity level. So that's our goal. But usually we're actually not aiming for 100% success probability, but something a bit below. So in this area here, we will get to back to that at the very end. Um, but this is just if you, uh, for example, read some uh, literature or so on differential cryptanalysis, you will often find something like, oh, great, we have found an attack with 40% success probability. Now, 40% maybe doesn't sound so large, um, but actually, um, if the complexity is low enough, it's still better than the generic attack, which means it's a meaningful attack. So that's our goal. And we are, today we're going to look at how to do this with differential cryptanalysis, but actually there are a number of important cryptanalysis techniques and we will see several of them uh, later this term. And we can actually divide the attack techniques that we do know into two main categories. The statistical category, which differential cryptanalysis belongs to, and the not statistical but algebraic um, techniques. So what statistical attacks usually do is um, they describe some behavior of the cipher uh, that doesn't always hold, but holds in some cases. And um, what we try is we try to detect whether this happens by looking at the input and output combinations of many, many plain text and cipher texts. And if we um, observe a tiny bias with respect to this property we're looking at, so for example, a particular output difference appears more often than it would uh, randomly, then we can use this for attacks. And linear cryptanalysis is another case of such a statistic attack. It also describes some property of the input and output um, that occurs with a certain probability, which is not so high, but if you have many, many, many samples, you can detect it. So you can distinguish this behavior from a random behavior. And actually, these two have many things in common. For example, the concept of characteristics, how to do key guessing, and so on. So we are going to look at these two first in the next few lectures. But we will also see some algebraic techniques. These are techniques that do not um, work using properties that work only sometimes or with some bias, but that always hold. So for example, they can describe the entire cipher as an equation system and try to use this for something like solving the equation system to derive a key or determine some deterministic properties about the output, stuff like that. Um, so there's here we have um, less of this success probability effect involved. Um, and also methodically it works quite different from these ones here. Okay, but now let's start um, looking at differential cryptanalysis and its core idea, namely tracking differences through a cipher. Uh, this attack has already celebrated its 30th birthday um, last year. So it was proposed in the beginning of the 90s uh, by uh, two researchers from uh, Israel, Biham and Shamir, and they originally suggested it for the block cipher DES, which was at the, at the time the most widely used um, standard, so the predecessor of the AES, which we use everywhere today. And 
A bit later, it actually turned out that the designers of DES already had some knowledge about a somewhat related attack um, even before the design. So um, in public knowledge, it's from the beginning of the 90s, but actually some similar things were already observed earlier in the 70s when the DES was designed. Um, it's, as I already said, one of the two major statistical attack techniques. And this means that whenever people propose a new block cipher, there always is expected some reasoning why this cipher is secure against this attack. So why the number of rounds, for example, is sufficient to protect, protect against differential cryptanalysis. Um, we will see in a moment that um, this attack is a so-called chosen plain text attack. So in order to apply it, the attacker must actually be able to to cause an encryption oracle, which has the secret key inside, inside, to encrypt certain messages that the attacker has chosen. And in particular, what the attacker wants to have encrypted is many messages which are similar to each other. So we're always looking at a pair of inputs which have some small difference. So for example, um, most of the plain text is the same, but there's one bit where they are different. And this is why we need a chosen plain text scenario so that the attacker can actually um, choose such plain text pairs. And the attacker then gives them to an encryption oracle that they are attacking. The encryption oracle will encrypt these two messages and return to the attacker the corresponding plain text scenarios. Now, in practice, this is not always easy to actually get someone with the secret key to do this, um, but still, it's one of these scenarios in which a block cipher must be secure. And what the attacker then does is they look at the um, difference that they see between the two ciphertexts and they either try to predict something about it or use it in order to find out something about the key. Um, so that's a short summary of, of what the attack entails. So the main point is that we um, are going to look at the cipher. I've illustrated it here schematically where each line here represents one round of the cipher. And we start here at the input with two messages, here called x, with a certain difference, which we know because we control it. And then we try to trace the effect of this difference through the cipher. Now, in each round, there's going to be some uncertainty about what happens to this, um, to this difference. So um, by the end of the cipher, we will only have a very tiny idea left about what the difference could be. So this could be, for example, we know one output difference, which is a tiny bit more likely than the others. So the question is now, how can we actually use this sort of property? Um, so in the first part of the lecture, we are mostly going to be concerned with this part here. So predicting this behavior, finding good differences to use here. And at the very end, we're going to look at the attack goals that we actually try to achieve with them. Um, and two of the most important ones are first key recovery, where we look at this, but not for the full cipher, but only for the for most of the rounds of the cipher. So we look at uh, we try to predict an intermediate difference between two intermediate values, like one or two rounds before the end. And what we then do is we um, obtain the cipher text here, and then. By guessing part of the key, we try to compute backwards and see whether we can observe our prediction or not. And this will allow us to learn something about the key. Um, another thing how you can use um, a difference uh, that appears with a higher probability is, for example, if you're trying to build a collision or something or a forgery, you try to predict the difference that's going to happen and then get rid of it in some way. For example, because the output of the cipher is x ord with some value that you control or so. If you can get rid of the difference, you can also often achieve um, an attack goal like collision or forgery. So let's have a look at this part now, looking what happens if we change a bit about the input. And to do this, we are going to have a look at a toy block cipher. So this is simpler than an ordinary block cipher. In particular, it's only 16 bits large but it does follow the structure that we've discussed before. So we see here three rounds. In each round, we XOR the key, we apply these S boxes, meaning we have 
um, a sort of lookup table like this, which takes any 4-bit input and tells us what the corresponding 4-bit output is. And this output is going to be the value we continue computing with. Then we have here um, a permutation layer, which shuffles around the intermediate bits of the intermediate value. And then we start with the next round, key addition, S-box, permutation, and so on. So now we want to flip a bit in this. So to look at two differences, uh, two inputs, which have some difference. Let's say the difference is right up here. So let's say we look at two messages, which are identical, except that they are different in this bit. Now what happens? The first thing that's going to happen is that we take these two different bits and XOR the same key bit to both. If you have two different values, one is 0, one is 1, and you XOR the same key bit to them, then afterwards they are still going to be different. Because if the key bit was 0, then both of them are going to be unchanged. And if the key bit was 1, then they are going to be swapped. So the 0 becomes a 1 and the 1 becomes a 0, but they are still going to be different. So the key addition actually doesn't do anything to the differences. It simply remains unchanged. And this is already the first uh, indicator that maybe it's a good idea to look at differences if they are invariant under certain operations of the cipher. Now it gets a bit more interesting. Our difference reaches an S-box. We call this S-box active or activated because we have a so-called active bit here. So we call it bit with the difference active. So it activates this S-box here. Big question is, what is going to happen? What can we say about the two outputs here? So what we can already say in advance is that all of the other S-boxes here, in both executions, they have the same input because the message was the same. So after key addition, they are still going to be the same. Um, and if you put the same uh, input twice into a function, you're going to get the same output twice. Um, so these will all have no difference at the output here. But here we can't tell exactly. So let's have a look at the exact definition of the S-box. What we're going to um, have here is we are looking at some two values here. We don't know exactly which ones at the moment, but two four-bit values which are going to be different in the first bit. Or in hexadecimal, they are going to have a difference of 0x8, hexadecimal 8. And what we want to know is what the output difference is. So let's just have a look at all possible combinations of input values which have this difference. One such combination is 0 and 8, which have a difference, so an XOR of 8. Let's look at the um, outputs that we get in the table. We see that the first value is mapped to a 2 and the other value is mapped to a 1. The XOR of the 2 is 3. So apparently one of the things that can happen is that the output has a difference of 3. But that's not the only thing that can happen. So for example, it can also be D or A. Or if I go through, I will observe that in total there are four possible options. 3, A, C and D, which can happen. So it's not like all output differences are possible, but we also don't know exactly which one is going to be. However, there are two things we do see here. The first thing, which is quite obvious, is that if we know the exact values, like if we know exactly that it was a 2 and an A, then we also know the exact output difference. We can simply compute it. And actually, we can also make a sort of derivative function out of this. So what we can do is we can derive this directional derivative of the function. So this S-box here is simply a function from 4 bits to 4 bits. And we can look at this derivative function in the direction of a certain input difference. And for any specific value, this function is going to give us the corresponding output difference. And this function can be implemented or designed as follows, or written down as follows. What it does is it takes the um, output uh, when the function is applied to the one input, x or the other output which I get when the S-box is applied to the modified input, so to the, um, to the x prime, which is x, x or the input difference. Uh, so this is a definition of a derivative and this is the result of the derivative. And actually it's not an accident that we call it a derivative function, because even though it's defined 
for discrete functions. Um, it actually uh, satisfies many of the properties that we know from difference um, from derivative functions or directional derivatives in analysis. So for example, this function here um, satisfies things like the sum rule or the product rule, um, which you know from uh, analysis T1. Um, so it's actually quite a, a nice object that we can work with. Um, and we will also see that, or we will not see that today, but we will see in a few weeks time, that actually this derivative function has some other similarities with derivatives, like decreasing the degree of polynomials and stuff like that, which is also going to make it useful later. But for now, all we need to know is if we know the values, we know the difference and vice versa. If we know the difference um, at the output, so if we know the input and the output difference, like we know the input difference was um, eight, for example, and the output difference was three, then we learn a bit about the values because not all values produce this output difference. So what we have is when we fix the differential here, the input difference and the output difference, then we only have certain solutions. So certain values which satisfy that um, if we apply our derivative function to this value, we receive the correct um, output difference. And how many uh, solutions we have for one such equation is what the differential distribution table shows us. So what this function maps is for every input difference and every output difference, it tells us how many values map this input difference to this output difference. So for example, if we look at the input difference of 8 we had before, then there are four possible pairs which produce an output difference of 3. We know one of the pairs, it was 0, 8, if I remember correctly, but there are apparently three others. Four other values map it to an A, four map it to a C, and four map it to a D. We see that in total the sum is 16, because there are 16 possible input values. So we must always have that. Um, what are some interesting things we see here? We see that all values are even, so there are multiple of two. And this makes sense because whenever we have a pair that satisfies our property, then swapping the two also satisfies the property. So for example, if 0, 8 is a solution, then 8, 0 is another solution. We also see that we have some larger numbers here. So in particular, this one is quite obvious. If the inputs are the same and have zero difference, then the outputs must also always be the same. Um, we notice here that we have another high value. This means that we have a weak S-box here because we have one other special input difference, which only allows one certain output difference. So it has a deterministic behavior in this case, which is something we'll see how to exploit later. And because the size of these numbers here is important, the larger the more predictable, um, we have a name for these things here. So we call the multiset of all values here. So in that case, it would be 16, 16, and many, many, many fours, and many, many, many zeros. This is called the spectrum of the function, the differential spectrum. And we also have a name for the largest value in the spectrum, except for this one on top here. And this name for the largest value in the spectrum is the differential uniformity. We had a slightly different name for that in cryptography. We called it the maximum differential probability. And the reason for this is that instead of looking at the number of solutions, we can also understand this as probabilities. So for example, if we have any random input pair with a difference of 8, then with a probability of 4 over 16, so 1 quarter, we know the output is going to be a 3. And with the same probability, it's going to be an A or a C or a D. In this case here, a C with 100% probability, 16 over 16, goes to an 8. So this is why this value divided by the total number of input values is the maximum differential probability. Okay, so I've now written down all these words that I've introduced on this page here. We're not going through the details because this doesn't really say much more than I already said. 
Um, there is one thing I didn't say yet, namely um, we call these combinations here. So this is a differential, one to one for example, a pair of input and output difference. And if this has a zero entry here, we call it an impossible differential. If it has a non-zero entry, it's a possible um, differential. And if it's this specific one here, this is the trivial differential. And we call the number of solutions for any possible differential um, the, a valid pair. So for example, 0, 8 is a valid pair for this differential here. Okay, so let's continue looking at our toy cipher. We know now that if we flip this one bit here, at the output there are four possible things that can happen. And each of them happens with a probability of 16 divided, uh, 4 divided by 16, or in other words, 2 to the power of minus 2. One of the things that can happen is that the output difference is a 3. Um, if we look at the permutation layer, we also see what's going to happen to these differences next. Because one of them is going to go to this S-box here, and another one is going to go to this X-box here. So in the second round, in this case, two more S-boxes are going to be active. Um, so uh, this part here, uh, is completely predictable, it has a probability of 1, and the next one would again add some uncertainty. So whenever an S-box is active, it adds some uncertainty in the shape of a probability. There are several more cases. We can notice that one of the differences, namely the A here, has the nice property that actually both of its output differences end up in the same S-box again. So this means fewer active S-boxes, which is a great thing because it means less uncertainty. And we can actually um, now continue here because it turns out that this difference can also be mapped back to an A and so on. So what we found is actually an iterative differential characteristic. Characteristic means it's a behavior across each round of the cipher. So for each intermediate result, it gives us a predicted difference, which only holds with a certain probability so for example, the probability of the differential up to here is 2 to the minus 2 times 2 to the minus 2 for this S-box here. And each other round would also use, um, would add a times 2 to the minus 2 to the overall probability of this particular um, differential characteristic. And what we see here is um, the entries of the differential distribution table of the S-box that we saw earlier influences this probability here. So if all entries are very small, then all of these probabilities are going to be small, and the cipher is going to be more unpredictable for the attacker. But there is another thing we observe here. Because we could find differences which only activate one S-box in each round, this looks pretty weak. And this is actually now not a property only of the S-box, but in particular of this permutation or mixing layer here. So the job of this mixing layer would actually be to make sure that this doesn't happen, that it's not possible, um, so that what we want to ensure is that each S-box output influences as many others as possible. And we see here that this is not really given. So for example, the output of this S-box here never influences this S-box here. This is something we could improve. And this is um, what we mean by the differential properties of the mixing layer or permutation layer. Um, and we can um, formalize a bit here what we've already seen. Namely, we've seen on the previous slide, the differential behavior was actually completely predictable of this function. And this is the case not only for bit permutations like we saw here, but for any linear function here, even if it has, for example, some XORs. This is because in linear functions, um, you can always predict the um, output by simply applying the function to the difference you're looking at. This is the basic linearity property. Um, so a linear function of a plus b is the same as the linear function of a plus the linear function of b. And what this means is that the derivative of this function here is actually a constant. Uh, so there is only one possible output value all inputs will produce this output difference. Um, 
And we can learn this output difference by simply applying the linear function to the input difference. That's it. Um, so they are always predictable. So the question is when is the layer good and when is it bad? And the main goodness property that we usually use is its branch number, B. What this branch number is defined as is this is the minimum number of active S boxes in any two consecutive rounds. If you look at this picture here, these are some two consecutive rounds and we see there are two active S boxes. So the branching number of this linear layer here is at most um, two. Uh, we will see a bit later that the definition of a branch number um, makes even more sense for slightly different structure of the cipher, but it also works for the one we have here. And um, what we would like to have is we would like to have a larger branch number because that would mean in total more active S boxes. For example, if the branch number were three, then at least one of the two rounds here would have to have two active differences, uh, S boxes, and thus a lower probability overall. And uh, the best case that we can achieve for this branch number is the number of S boxes per round plus one. That's the optimal case because you always can have the case that you have just one input S box in the first round and then all, in the best case, all um, S boxes in the next round, next round are activated. The branch number can't get higher than that. Um, but this one only works um, properly if we have an actual mixing function and not just bit permutations. So let's have a look at one very well-known design which does have such proper mixing functions. And this design is the AES. Um, so I guess most of you already know this one. So let's just have a very brief comparison about what's different in the AES compared to the cipher we just saw. Uh, the first and last step of the AES are exactly the same as we have here. So um, the first step is an S-box step. However, because the block size is larger, it consists of 16 8-bit values. We have a total of 16 S-boxes that are applied. So each box here represents an 8-bit value. And each 8-bit value goes into the 8-bit S-box to produce the new output. We also do have the same last step, which is simply the addition of the round key, so the XOR of the round key. But the linear layer is different, um, and it consists of two parts, the first one of them being a mixed columns function, which applies a function to every column of the state, namely a linear function, so it's representable as multiplying, multiplying by a matrix. And this multiplication happens over a finite field. So the result is again an 8-bit value. Uh, this is the mixed column step, and the shift row step then takes all of the, um, of the bytes in one column and distributes them to different columns for the next round. So then the next round, they're going to be mixed by the next mixed column step. So here, this is actually a bit permutation, but additionally, we have this step here, which um, has an actual linear function, which has actual XORs inside. So you can see here that um, if you multiply this to the vector here, then each output here will actually depend on all input cells. It's going to be the XOR of some multiples of all of these input cells. Okay, let's have a look at this design in differential cryptanalysis and let's see what happens if we flip a bit. So, um, we again are going to flip just one bit before the first S box. Um, Hexa, please don't... Please leave my glass of water in peace. Um, and let's instead let you help us here with differential cryptanalysis. So, um, if we have just one uh, difference before the first S-box, um, then this is going to lead to some output, um, some output difference of this S-box here. Um, we see here a uh, given probability. And this is actually the best pro possible probability in AES. It's 2 to the minus 6, so a lot smaller than in the toy cipher, meaning the AES is already less predictable in only this layer here. So, next step is shift rows. 
Here we simply change the ordering of the cells, so it doesn't change the actual difference. Um, then is the mixed column step, and this is going to blow up this difference into a vector of differences. So multiplying this by the um, row of the matrix, which is 2, 1, 1, 3, you can see that here is um, double this value in finite field arithmetic. Here the ones are simply copies of these difference, and here we have the um, three times the difference. So here we have um, a first hint at our branch number. Uh, we see that potentially this could actually be the best possible branch number, because we do have a total of five um, S boxes in this example here. Of course, we would need to check all other possible differences here to verify this. In the next round, we already have four active S boxes, uh, but this column is then distributed to lots of different columns so that after the next mixed column step, we actually have a fully active state. So this is one potential path that a one-bit difference can take in AES, and it's one of the best possible paths for two rounds. Um, so since 2 to the minus 6 is the best possible um, probability here, and um, we actually have a mixed column step um, that satisfies this best possible branch number of 5, um, this means we have at least 5 uh, active S boxes in two rounds. And actually what we can show and what I think you will see, uh, what, what Markus will explain to you next week, I think, is how you can extend this to um, an even better bound for four rounds. Today we're going to have to, to see an alternative way of also showing this property, namely that if you look at four rounds, you actually have at least 25 active S boxes, meaning the total probability is at most 2 to the minus 6, so that's the probability of one S-box, times 25, because we have at least 25 S uh, active S-boxes, so it's already 2 to the minus 150. So this is good for two reasons. First reason, 2 to the minus 150 is already a very small probability in any case. And second, um, we're at this uh, nice point here, that 2 to the minus 150 is actually a lot smaller than 2 to the minus 128. And 2 to the minus 128 would also be the random probability of getting a certain output difference. So what this means is that looking at any specific differential characteristic doesn't give us any better estimate of the output difference than just random guessing. Because with random guessing you would already have a success probability of 2 to the minus 128. Which means for just from the differential perspective, um, we already would get an attack complexity here for this four round thing that would be worse than the corresponding um, generic attack. So that sounds good. So this is uh, because the AES is actually designed to resist exactly this sort of attack. Um, so how does such a four-round characteristic look like? Let's look at it, but I'm not printing the actual values here. I'm just printing the pattern because very often we're talking just about these patterns of active S boxes where um, a box is colored if there is a difference in the corresponding byte and it's white if there is no difference in the corresponding byte. So we already saw the first two rounds here. This is the same as on the previous slide. And here we now see an example of how this could evolve in rounds 3 and 4. Um, so that in total you see that the number of red boxes, which are exactly the S-box input differences, um, this number is 25. So it's 1 plus 4 plus 16 plus 4. And um, so what could happen in rounds uh, 3 and 4, if we are very, very lucky, is that the, um, the differences here after the S-box could be mapped to values so that in each column here, yeah, come in or stay outside. Um, so that in each column here, um, all of the differences are just such special values that if you apply the mixed columns matrix, you get just one active cell at the output. This is of course a very unlikely event, but it can happen. And the same can happen again in round number four. Me, me, me. Ah. Me, me, me. 
things we could do. So, okay. Um, so let's have a look at how we can actually prove that there is no better characteristic with fewer active S boxes. One of the ways how you can prove this is by a pen and paper argument. Um, but here, instead, I want to show how to do this with an automated solver. So I want to give a brief overview of tools for um, finding such characteristics. Uh, so the motivation is that um, both the attacker and the designer are interested in the question. The attacker wants to find one good characteristic with a high probability. The uh, designer wants to prove that there isn't even a single characteristic with a high probability. So both are interested in what the best possible characteristics are. And there are different ways how you can find this. You can do it by hand. You can write special tools just for this purpose. Or you can try to use general purpose solvers. Uh, so these are general equation solving tools, um, which we can apply here. And uh, some examples of this are first SAT solvers and SMT solvers. The second one that we want to look at is mixed integer linear programming solvers. And there's a third one, um, which is a sort of generalization of many of these things, which is constraint programming. Um, okay, so let's have a look at this um, generic general purpose solver and how we can use it for crypto. Because this is actually at first glance not very intuitive, but if you look at it, it turns out to be very simple. So let's have a look at what a MILP solver is. Um, MILP is short for Mixed Integer Linear Programming, and this is in turn a variant of linear programming. Linear programming is a method for solving optimization problems, but only a very, very special kind of optimization problems. Namely, one where you have some decision variables. Um, so you have d decision variables, all of them real numbers usually positive real number or non-negative real numbers. You have an objective function that you want to minimize or maximize, and this function has to be linear. This means it can be written as some sum of some coefficients times each of these decision variables. So for example, if I have two decision variables x and y, the objective function could be uh, x plus y, or x plus 5y if y is five times more costly than x, something like that. And you also have linear constraints. Um, so these are side conditions that every solution must satisfy. Um, and we, when we write this down in mathematical terms, we often write this as a vector vector multiplication here for the objective function and as a matrix vector multiplication for the constraints where each line of the matrix describes one constraint and we usually write, write st in front which means such that or subject to okay so what can these constraints look like well they have just the same shape they are also linear combinations of the decision variables and you can put the constraint that this linear combination must be bigger than or smaller than some constant bound. So in other words, you can never multiply two decision variables together in your functions. You can only use linear combinations. So in very, very short terms, you can write down a linear optimization problem like this. You want to maximize or minimize over all values of the decision variables in d-dimensional uh, real space, this objective function, which is a linear function, such that um, all these constraints, the linear constraints hold, and all the variables are non-negative. Um, you can also get rid of this part here, so you can also ignore that for now. So that's the general thing we have. Now, if you look at this, this is very, very far away from what we would need. In particular, it has all these real valued decision variables, which we don't really need in, um, in differential truth analysis because we are only talking about discrete stuff. We are only talking about zeros and ones. And this is where the MI in MILP comes in. So the mixed integer part. What this means is that some of the variables are allowed to be integers. So instead of having 
uh, decision variables in r to the power of d, you can have decision variables in um, z to the power of i, so i integer variables, and d minus i real variables. And what actually we're going to do is we're usually going to choose only integer variables and not a single real variable. So we're not really working in the space where this is originally intended for and where this is most efficient, but the solvers still work. So if you want to visualize all of this graphically, uh, the prob problems look like this. So you have some constraints, which I've denoted here in green, and each constraint um, in the two-dimensional case consists of a line that separates the entire space into an invalid half and a valid half. So in German you would call these halbeven half planes. And um, for example, you could have these three constraints. So this constraint here says everything below this line, this constraint says everything below that line is good, and this constraint says everything left of this one here is good. So these are the constraints. Um, if we also have the non-negativity constraint, then this um, five-angle thing here is the space of potential valid solutions in the linear programming case. Now we need our objective function, which gives us a direction in which to optimize. If we want to maximize x plus y, then the further we go in this direction here, the better, so the larger the result. Um, so for example, if you look at these lines here, all points on this line here have the same value, and everything below has a worse value. So in other words, this corner here in this example is the optimal solution of this um, optimization problem. And the fact that this is a corner, and the fact that actually the best solutions are always in the corners, um, gives us an indication of why linear programming can be done so efficiently, even if you have many, 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 many variables and constraints. The story is a bit different for mixed integer linear programming, because the mixed integer part, if we now require both x and y to be integers, means that not everything here is a valid solution, but just these points here. And the best point is in this case one that is close to the corner. You can see that if you do the uh, line through this one here, all the other points are below, so they are worse. Okay, so we're now in the vicinity at least of one of the corner points. And um, however, this mixed integer part turns this um, problem in a more combinatorial and thus potentially more complicated problem. Even if you have fewer candidates, but you cannot so easily characterize the good candidates anymore. Okay, but still we are going to need the mixed integer version because um, we're working with bits. If you do have such a problem um, and you don't want to solve it by just looking at it, you can use solvers for this purpose. Um, so there are some, uh, here's a short summary of what I said, namely that LP is relatively easy. There is a well-known method how to solve it efficiently. MILP, unfortunately, um, can be NP-hard problems. So you can encode NP-hard problems as MILP problems, and solving them will be correspondingly harder. What the underlying solvers usually do is, they take the integer variables and then split the search space into the values that are smaller and those that are in, the, in that this variable is larger than a particular bound. Um, so you get a sort of search tree from this. Um, and then you try, try to bound each of the cases and only continue searching in the better ones, more or less. Um, so in any case, if you have many integer variables, you have a sort of potential explosion of the complexity. Um, but, um, you can just try to solve it anyways by putting it one, you know, into one of the well-known solver packages. And two of the best ones that we know are the Cplex solver by IBM and the Gorobi solver, uh, which is academically a bit more widely used and whose team is also closely tied to the team um, or to the previous team of the Cplex solver. And how do you use these tools? There are actually different ways. On the one hand, these are standalone executables, 
that eat a certain input file format, namely the .lp format, which stands for linear programming. And these are simply an encoding of the linear equations that we saw. Um, however, there are also some very convenient interfaces how you can directly trigger these um, programs as libraries from your favorite programming language. So in particular, it's for example very easy to use in Sage. I'm going to show you an example later. Okay, but now we have great tools, that's fine, but how do we use it for crypto? So let's look again at the previous example of patterns in the AES. And we want to use now MILP solvers in order to find the best possible patterns um, for AES, for some number of rounds. So the idea is that we first determine what the best possible patterns are. We are just going to assume that every S-box um, can be bounded with the um, maximum differential probability of the S-box. So what we can do if we find the best patterns is we immediately get a bound, which tells us if the best pattern has this many S-boxes, and each S-box has this maximum differential probability, it gives us an overall maximum probability of all possible characteristics. So for a designer, this is all we need. For an attacker, we would usually also, also need some concrete instantiation of this pattern. So some actual choice of differences that works with this pattern. This is something we would need to search for in a second step, either with another tool or by hand, or that depends a bit on the case. So to find this um, specific example like we saw before. Now let's have a look at how to encode this in MILP. What we essentially want to do is we want to tell the MILP solver this is what a valid pattern looks like. So describe valid patterns. Tell it what the cost of a pattern is. The cost is simply going to be based on the number of active S boxes. And then we tell it now please find me the best possible patterns that are valid and have the minimum cost. So for this we need to look at each of the steps in turn and see how we can model it using this MILP style equations. Um, so the first question, the most important question is what is going to be our set of uh, decision variables? And we're going to do this very simply. We see that the pattern essentially deter um, has active and inactive cells and we are simply going to use one binary variable per state style for each of the intermediate result. So each small square that you see here is one binary variable. Wait a moment, how do we get binary variables? Now this is actually very simple. We simply get an integer variable. We say that the integer variable is at least zero and at most one, and ta-da, we have bit for a binary variable. Okay, so this is easy. Uh, we have one binary variable per um, cell, which tells us active or inactive. And now we need to describe what the transitions can look like. Let's first have a look at add round key. So if I have a certain input pattern here, what can be the pattern that I observe after add round key? Well, if I look only at the same case we had before, where the key is always the same, then adding the key actually doesn't change the difference pattern. Any active pattern before will be active afterwards, and any inactive pattern will remain inactive. So in other words, we actually can use the same variable for the input and output because they must have the same value. Very easy so far. Next step, sub bytes. Well, that's actually the same. Any active input byte will turn into an active S-box output. Um, so in terms of variables, we can actually still use the very same variables as we had at the input. Uh, what we do have here is that each um, active variable contributes something to the cost. Um, now we can do this cost in different ways. Either we can simply count the number of active S-boxes. In that case, the objective function is going to be minimize the sum of all S-box variables here, plus all S-box variables here, plus all variables in each round. If I want to have a bound on the actual um, probability, I can also do something like I can say the cost is um, the exponent of the min maximum differential probability. So I could also say that 6 is the cost of one active input uh, because 2 to the minus 6 is the 
minimum, uh, the maximum probability of any ice box. But I guess the easiest is just counting ice boxes. Okay, next step, shift rows, um, where we simply shift each cell here to a different cell position here. So in other words, we're just renaming variables. Um, we can now either create new, new variables and write down the equations, like um, this uh, old variable corresponds to this new variable, and this one here to this one here, and so on. Or we simply use the same variables here, but in a different order when we describe mixed columns. And mixed columns is going to be the tricky part. Um, what do we know about mixed columns? Well, actually all we know is its branch number. We know that it has a branch number of 5. This means that the sum of also the number of active um, cells at the input plus the number of active cells at the output together must be at least 5, but it can also be 0. So it's either, five, uh, either 0 or at least 5. And modeling this is going to require one extra helper variable. Um, otherwise, if we look just at the case that the column is active, we can simply write down the equation like that. So um, now let's have a look at how to write this down in mid language. So what are going to be our variables? We are going to have two types of variables. The first one, S, R, I, J, is going to um, tell us whether the S box or the byte in round R, in column, uh, in row I and in column J is going to be active or not. That's a binary variable. And we're going to have these helper variables here, one per round and column, which tells us whether this mixed columns is active. So whether there is at least one active cell involved in this. Now I can write down the program as follows. That's the entire program, that's it. So let's have a look at it line by line. The first one is the objective function. What we want to do is we want to minimize the number of active S boxes. So in other words, we want to minimize the sum of all these variables for each round, for each um, column and for each row. Our constraint R, and this is when it, we need to model um, the mixed column step, let's first have a look at this part here. Here and here we're summing the input cells and the output cells of one mixed column step. So we have one of these lines here for every round and for every column. And within this column we have now four input cells and four output cells, which we sum together. And this needs to be at least the branch number of five. However, we now have this decision variable that tells us whether mixed columns is active or not. If the decision variable is zero, it means mixed column is not active. And then this um, inequality here is trivial because then it simply says the sum of the, um, or the number of S boxes must be at least zero very easy to satisfy, whatever the values are. If the decision variable is 1, then this equation reads the sum must be at least 1 times b, so 5, um, and that's exactly the bound we do have for an active cell. What's missing at this point is that we actually need to force the program to choose this variable here consistently with these variables here. Otherwise, it will always tell us, ah, oh, let's put a 0 here, Whatever the values here are, this, is, this part is satisfied. So we need to force it to set m to 1 as soon as at least one of these is active. And this is what happens in this part here. Because we write, the sum needs to be at most 8 times the decision variable. If the decision variable is now 0, which corresponds to no active S boxes, then this becomes an important equation. It says the sum of all variables must be at most zero. So in other words, it has to be zero. And this is what we want to achieve. Whereas if m is one, then this equation simply reads the sum of these eight values is at most eight. That's a trivial equation. So depending on whether m is zero or one, one of these two equations is going to be trivial and the other one is going to be important. Okay, so that already sounds like we're finished now. However, if we run the program with just the first two lines, or the 
or or um, ten times uh, four times uh, ten times four plus one um, lines, then what would the solver give us in return? It would give us a solution where simply everything is zero. All the S boxes is inactive. Because of course there is a valid solution, it's a trivial solution, it's just not the one that we're interested in. So we add this non-triviality constraint, which simply says there must be at least one active S box, please. At least in the first round. Okay, so that's how to write this down in math. You might be more interested in how to write this down in computer science, and that's like this. It's essentially the same thing, but written in Sage or Python. So what are we doing here? We're first declaring our variables. So we, oh, very first we say we want to do a mixed integer linear program. Um, and we want to minimize, not maximize. Um, this example here is for four rounds. And we have these two types of variables here. The way this variable declaration works in um, when you use Sage is that you actually just give the name of the group of variables uh, so that's the short name that you use as a variable, and that's the long name how it can print the outputs. Um, both of them are going to be binary type variables. And once you've declared this variable, you can actually index it with any indexing you like, and with any fresh index, it will generate you a new binary variable to use. So it's very um, convenient. Now we need to write down the constraints. So for each round and for each column, we have this constraint about the input and output cells of um, mixed columns. Here's the sum of all of them. You can use simply the sum function. Um, and now we have the constraint. So we want that this sum is at least as large as five times our mixed columns decision variables and at most eight times our decision variable for round R and column J. So this describes the entirety of the round functions. Then we add the one uh, non-triviality constraint. So you, we add a constraint that the sum of the S boxes in the first round is at least one. And um, at the bottom here we now have the objective function. So what we want to minimize is the sum of all S box activities in all rounds, in all rows, in all columns. And solve. That's it. So this one is the, the, the stage that takes a while. And after that you can call the result using, so get objective value gives you the resulting value for four rounds it would be 25 because we have at least 25 active S boxes and with p get values you get um, an example assignment that satisfies this um, bound. So this is a valid solution and additionally you have the guarantee that it is an optimal solution and that this is the optimal value um, that is possible under these constraints. And um, so you can just run this in your Sage. For small problems like just four rounds of AES, this is super fast. However, if you want to do something larger, um, you will notice that the inbuilt solver of Sage is unfortunately pretty slow. And you can also, instead of solving here, you can export this program to the LP format, feed it to a faster solver and parse back in the result. The result parsing part is the painful part. Okay, um, so, so far so easy. What, what can we summarize here? Um, we will, um, if we use this tool for more than four rounds, we can confirm that whenever we have k times four rounds, um, this, these have at least k times 25 active S boxes. That's exactly what we would expect from theory. So nothing new here. However, we can of course use this for more complicated scenarios than just plain AS. For example, we can look at it with related key characteristics where there are allowed to be differences in the key. We can also use this for different designs, like for example, uh, tweakable block ciphers, where we definitely are going to have differences in the tweak. We can also adapt it for different types of mixed columns with a different branch number and so on. So this was the simplest possible, um, but these uh, MILP tools are nowadays used very, very often whenever we design a new block cipher or try to show some new property about it. Okay, so this is how to prove that no good different uh, characteristics exist or how to find good characteristics for a cipher. 
Now let's have a look at, um, in the last part about how we can actually exploit them and what we can use them for. So what do we do once we've actually found a good differential? If you remember, in the first part of the lecture, we had this type of um, characteristic here. And we said that it has a certain probability, which is defined by the number of active S-boxes in each step. However, once it's about exploiting it, we actually don't care and have no way to verify what exactly the pattern was in between here. All we care about and all we can judge is what we see at the very output and input. So in other words, we have no clue what's going on here in the middle. Uh, we just can control the input and we're interested in the output. And there might actually be more than just one possible pattern here in the middle. So this is one pattern, but there might be more which also lead to the same output difference. This is why the total probability from this input to this output, so the differential probability of this cipher, could actually be larger than the bound we have found. And this is also the reason why if you use, um, even if you have a guaranteed result like in the previous case, this does not mean that you have a guarantee that the cipher is secure against differential group analysis. Because it might always happen that you have, for example, a so-called clustering effect, where many, many different paths, different patterns, all lead to the same output difference. And investigating this uh, clustering effect is one of the jobs of the designer or of the attacker um, that you usually need to do. So in reality, the picture is a bit uh, more complicated than just running a MILP solver, but it's um, still one of the main things that you still have to do as a designer to show that at least there is no single characteristic that's sufficient for attacks. Okay, so if we do have now such a differential with a high probability, what can we do with it? I already hinted at it in the beginning. One of the things you can do with it is create, for example, forgeries. And I want to show you an example of how this could be done in um, a well-known message authentication code construction, CBC MAC, where if you remember CBC was short for cipher block chaining. Um, so this is a way how you can extend the fixed size block cipher to a message authentication code for a long message. Um, to recall that this worked as follows. If you have a long message that is L blocks long, let's say it's exactly a size that's a multiple of the block size, then we can compute an authentication tag by XORing 0 to the first block, encrypting it, and then taking the cipher text and XORing it to the next block. Again, taking the output, XORing it to the next message block before encrypting, and so on. And after reading the final block, you take the final output as tag. Actually, to make this a secure Mac, you have to tweak some small things, but let's take it like this for now. Um, how can we use a differential characteristic or a differential for this mode of operation? Um, so this is useful if we have found a differential which has a probability larger than, quite a bit larger than, 2 to the minus n when n is the block size. And at the same time, this is also the tag size. Um, so why is that? Let's assume I have such a high probability differential. What I can do is I can first um, query the um, MAC oracle for the MAC for one any random message that I, uh, that I know. And now I will construct a second message that has the same tag with a certain probability, with a certain success probability. And what I can do is if I have a differential um, delta x, delta y, I can choose my second message by XORing delta x to one of the message blocks. So in other words, this is the difference that's going to go into the block cipher. And if now this block cipher has a probability p of producing delta y as the output, what I can do is I can XOR this delta y to my next message block. And what's going to happen? The two delta y's are going to cancel out here. So if I was lucky, which happens with probability p, and here we actually got delta y at the output. In that case, the differences are going to cancel. This is going to have a zero input difference and thus a zero output difference. 
or in other words, it's going to produce the same tag for a different message. Um, and if p was bigger than um, 2 to minus the block size, then this probability is better than 2 to minus the tag size, which, if you remember, is the probability for randomly guessing the correct tag. So if p is large enough, then doing this attack is faster than randomly guessing the, the tag. There's a higher success probability. Okay. Let's have a look at another case, namely at the case of key recovery. This is a bit more complicated. I assume now that we have found a good um, characteristic or a good differential for almost all of the rounds of the block cipher. For example, R minus one rounds. And again, let's assume that the probability is a lot better than two two minus the block size. What we can do now is we can encrypt many message pairs which satisfy my input difference. So many pairs with input difference delta m each. And then I get a couple of ciphertexts. For each of the ciphertexts I guess a part of the last round key or all of it depending on how much I need to compute backwards to this state here. And now I check whether my ciphertext pair produces a pair of intermediate values which has exactly the predicted difference. If it has the predicted difference, I give the corresponding key candidate a thumbs up. If it doesn't, I don't. And this I repeat for many of the messages. So in other words, each key candidate is going to collect some thumbs up. Because, of course, this intermediate result can um, I can receive that either because it was actually the correct key, so I'm looking at actually the correct intermediate result, and this co correct intermediate result had the high probability difference. So that's the positive case for giving a thumbs up, but I might also just give a thumbs up by accident because I randomly observe the correct um, difference here. And uh, depending on how large P is, one of the two is going to be a lot more frequent. And also depending on how many pairs I choose. And it turns out that the right number of pairs to choose is approximately 1 divided by p. So for example, if my uh, differential has a probability of 2 to the minus 30, I'm going to use approximately 2 to the 30 um, pairs. And for each of them, I have to run through all key candidates. So you can already guess that if I do it straight like it's described here, the complexity of this is actually quite large because for each pair here and for each key I need to check this intermediate result. So I will produce many, 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 many intermediate results um, and thus also many false positives. Uh, let's have a look at this for um, an actual cipher, for a toy cipher and uh, then see why the complexity is not actually that bad. So let's have a look at the cipher we saw before at a total of eight rounds of it. Now I'm going to look at the differential for seven rounds. Uh, using exactly the pattern we saw before, um, with an input difference of 8000. And after seven rounds, I observe A000 with a probability of 2 to the minus 14. Now let's see how I can do a key recovery with this. How much of a key do I have to guess to actually verify this intermediate result? The straightforward approach would be, I guess the entire key, compute backwards, and check the entire state. However, we can notice something here. If this um, differential actually holds until the intermediate result, then I actually know that the input difference to all these here is going to be zero. So in that case, the output difference for all of those is also going to be zero. So this means I actually know some conditions for the, for the ciphertext pair that is a prerequisite for having a valid pair. So actually I can throw away all the ciphertext pairs that have a difference here because they definitely cannot be the result of a valid pair for the seven rounds here. This means I can actually get rid of most of my pairs and we keep only relatively few. Because 
each ciphertext pair has a probability of 2 to the minus 12 um, of having the right value in all of these places here um, because it needs 12 zeros here in the difference, in the ciphertext difference. So I will only keep one out of every 2 to the 12 pairs that I get. The others I can all throw away. Now I'm keeping only the pairs that have zeros here and some unknown bits at this position, this position, this position, and this position. In other words, the positions that correspond to this S-box here. So only for these places do I actually need to guess the keys. So I have now way fewer ciphertext pairs than in the beginning. And for each of these ciphertext pairs, I only need to guess four of the key bits in order to, so I take the um, these four bits of each ciphertext pair, XOR the key to both, compute backwards to here, so I get two four-bit values here. I um, apply the inverse S-box and I get some results. And now I only need to check in this small position here whether I observe the correct difference of 1010. So this means instead of running key recovery for all key candidates and for every pair, I'm just running it for the filtered pairs, which are way, way fewer, and I only guess the necessary key bits. Because for all of the other key bits, it's totally independent of the key value. In all cases, I'm going to get a zero difference here. So these are irrelevant. And this gives us a more detailed um, formula for the complexity um, of the key recovery step, and also for how many messages I need. And one of the key metrics that are defined here to evaluate this is the so-called signal-to-noise ratio. So this compares the signal, meaning all the cases I got the right difference here because it actually followed the characteristic. This is the signal, and the noise is all the times that I accidentally observe um, the right difference here, even though I guessed a completely garbage key, um, it just accidentally produced the right result, which happens with a certain probability. Um, and depending on how high the signal-to-noise ratio is, I can need to adjust how many messages I query. If I have a very high signal-to-noise ratio, it means I usually observe the right difference for the right reasons, then I can take a bit fewer messages. If I have a very low signal-to-noise ratio, I need more messages. And if the signal-to-noise ratio is so low that I actually can't see the signal among all the noise, then I can't perform an attack at all. And if we look at the cipher like the previous one, then I can compute the signal-to-noise ratio as follows. It depends on the probability of the characteristic. And now the part that corresponds to the key guessing thing. Um, so how, how do I get noise? I get noise when I guess incorrect keys. Um, so this is where the 2 to the minus k comes in, where k is the key size, the guessed key part. And um, um, for, for the noise here, I have two more parameters that are important, namely um, the number of candidates that get upvoted per pair. So if I look at one specific plain text ciphertext pairs, how many keys um, give the correct intermediate result? And the second important number is how many pairs are left after I filtered the ciphertext, after I threw out all the ciphertexts that are guaranteed to be wrong. And then if I know the signal-to-noise ratio, um, I can use this, um, this approximation here. If the signal-to-noise ratio is relatively large, so larger than 2 or a lot larger than 2, then I need approximately 3 times 1 divided by p pairs. 1 divided by p pairs is the number of pairs I need to generate approximately one right result. Because each result is um, valid with probability um, p. So if I have 1 divided by p um, pairs, then there's going to be approximately one valid pair. And I need to now distinguish this valid pair from the noise. So the 3 means I need to connect enough data that the correct key has 
uh, approximately three upvotes and all the other ones are going to have something like zero or one upvotes. And to be sure that the best one is indeed the one with the most upvotes, um, I have this factor of three here. Uh, if uh, the signal to noise ratio is um, smaller, then the um, original authors suggest a much larger, um, larger number of repetitions, so larger number of expected valid pairs. They recommend something like aim for 30 um, valid pairs. So to make the signal stand out from the, from the noise. Let's apply this formula here and let's try to follow it um, from uh, in our example. So in our example here, um, the probability, we already know that's 2 to the minus 14. That's a probability from here to here. Then the number of key bits I have to guess is 4. So 2 to the minus 4 here. And now the question is, what ratio remains after um, the after the uh, filtering? That's 2 to the minus 12. And how many candidates um, remain after um, guessing the right key? And this number of candidates is actually 4. So 4 times um, um, the 2 to minus 2 here. Where does, the, um, does this come from? I know that if I have some difference here, and I guess then the, because I know the probability of this S box here, 1 out of 4 is going to generate the right, um, the right value by accident. And so in total I get a signal to noise ratio of 4. Okay, um, I mentioned in the beginning that another important factor is the uh, success probability of an attack. And for this there is another more complicated formula to guess this. So the point here is to guess what is the chance that with all of this uh, upvote thingy, the correct key is actually the one with the most upvotes. So we said already this depends on the signal to noise ratio. Um, it depends also on um, the number of keys, I guess, and um, what, what, I'm, what this formula expresses here is, in total, if I want to achieve a certain success probability, PS, how many message pairs do I need to query? And this number depends on the signal to noise ratio. A high ratio um, means I need a bit fewer messages. It depends on the success probability. If I want a higher success probability, I need a bit more messages. And um, it also depends on the number of key guesses I make, um, because these wrong keys always um, add these this random uh, noise essentially. And of course it depends on the probability. So again I have this 1 divided by p here as the main factor that determines it and all the other parameters just control which um, number I put in front. So in other words this is the more precise version of the approximate 3 for high signal to noise ratio, 30 for low signal to noise ratio that we saw on the previous slide. This is the more precise variant. Um, explaining it is a bit more complicated, so this phi function here um, is a function of the standard normal distribution, namely the quantile function. And I think all the other notation should be clear here. So you're probably not going to need this, but this is just as a summary. Please don't learn it by heart. Uh, just remember that the data complexity is essentially controlled by the probability. And all the other things just add a small factor in front. Okay, so let's conclude. Um, we heard the first part um, or the first lecture about differential cryptanalysis today because it's one of the two major statistical attack techniques. You are going to hear a bit more about it next week from Markus. Um, and this basic variant, what uh, the attacker and the designer uh, respectively try to do is, the attacker tries to find one or a few characteristics with very high probability for an attack, whereas the defender, so the designer, tries to prove that no such characteristics exist. However, even proving this isn't a full security proof against this attack. This is a common property of all the symmetric 
cryptanalysis um, techniques. You can usually not guarantee that there is no attack. You can just guarantee that these particular attack variants are all multiplicable. So showing the security of a cipher is a lot of work because for each attack vector, you need arguments why it doesn't apply, why the number of rounds is high enough to prevent this attack. Um, one great thing about um, differential cryptanalysis, despite its general power, is that there are many, many variants and some of these are going to be explained next week. So these include things like truncated differential attacks, impossible differential attacks, higher order differential attacks, which means having not just two, but more uh, messages per pair or per set and so on. And it's also useful to achieve very different goals. You can use it to recover keys or do forgery in a Mac like we saw today. But uh, in other variants of it, you can also use it, for example, to find collisions in hash functions where you have no keys at all and you can actually observe your intermediate results. So there it's also a very, very powerful technique. Um, finally, something um, that you might also hear more about next week is um, the analysis, as I've described it so far, actually relies on a number of assumptions and approximations that we haven't seen so clear, clearly today. So, for example, the approximation that the DDT directly gives us a probability that I can multiply up um, for the total probability actually depends on things. It depends on the key schedule, it depends on um, how strong clustering effect is, and several more things. So what we've seen so far are actually mostly approximations. We know that in practice they are, for secure ciphers, very close to reality, but you should be aware that there is still a gap and that you can never be 100% sure of something. Okay, um, with that said, um, that's the end of the lecture for today. I am available for questions now. And while you think about whether you have questions, um, I would also prepare the slides for the um, question or for the exercises, because as you know, next week is the deadline for the exercises. And we promise to have um, a sort of question hour today. So the plan for this is I'm going to switch slides a moment. That's going to take uh, five minutes or so. I can we can have a look together again at the um, at the assignment. I have some questions to try to get an impression about how far along you all are with the intermediate tasks or with the individual tasks. And um, well, the rest of it is a question or meaning we're waiting for your questions. So the idea would be that general questions are covered here on YouTube. So if you have questions like how do I approach this task or is my understanding correct that blah, blah, blah. We can clarify that here. We can use Menti for that. And afterwards, as every week, I'm going to also be available on Discord. If you have more specific questions, like if you have code and want to uh, know about uh, does that look correct? Why is this not working? Is this approach okay? And so on. So if you have more personal questions, let's do that on um, Discord. So I'd be waiting in the, um, in the chat there. And in the meantime, while you think about whether you have any questions, I will um, um, load the, um, the exercise tasks to, to the stream here. So see you in a moment and I'll be back in something like two minutes or so. And afterwards I can have a look at the questions and the exercise questions.
Okay, let's see. We do already have a question. Uh, so this is apparently already for the um, exercises. So you implement it. I'm going to get that when we come to the actual um, part in the lecture. So I'll have to ask you to wait for a second. And let's see whether um, we have any questions respective to the uh, lecture. And indeed we do. Um, so, is differential cryptanalysis more of a thing to consider when designing a cipher, so it's secure, or is it also actually used for attacks? Well, definitely both. Um, so, uh, any new cipher is expected to come with reasoning why these attacks don't work. However, we've seen time and time again that um, the designer's reasoning isn't always waterproof. So actually, uh, much of my uh, dissertation was exactly this, taking real ciphers, not round reduced, and still finding differential attacks on them. Um, but usually they don't work in the straightforward way we've seen today. So it's not sufficient to just find um, a good MILP um, solution, for example, for a certain number of rounds. But then you need to take a closer look. Are all the S-boxes involved here actually independent or are there maybe some um, statistical dependencies which increase the overall probability or if it's a hash function can i do something clever where i start introducing the difference in the middle and start guessing out from there and whatnot so um, it's absolutely used for real um, attacks it's also actually the foundation of some of the very few real world cryptographic attacks that we've seen in the last few years um, so, um, usually most of the widely deployed crypto um, is good crypto, so it's actually immune against this attack, like the AES, for example. Um, this cannot be used to actually attack the AES. However, um, occasionally people still use outdated crypto or custom crypto, and one of these cases is the MD5 hash function. Uh, this is an example of an outdated primitive. It has been known to be insecure for more than 20 years, and uh, attacks have been known for more than 15 years, uh, but still this was used in many places to sign certificates. And um, one of the few examples of real-world malware based on crypto is the Flame malware, which was um, used to attack some, I think, some power plants um, in the Near East. And uh, this attack was actually based on finding collisions in MD5, and this collision search was, in turn, an extension of this differential cryptanalysis uh, we saw here today. Um, the situation for this attack is a bit different because you have a hash function where you can see the intermediate results for any input that you choose because it's unkeyed. So you need some extra tricks, but in the end it comes down to differential cryptanalysis. So yes, it's actually um, useful. And um, some of the pitfalls that designers fall into is, well, the very bad ones don't know about differential cryptanalysis. And the good ones may overlook things like a clustering effect or dependencies between the S-boxes um, or uh, complex attack scenarios where you have differences not just in the plain text but also in the tweak, stuff like that. Um, Okay, uh, let's have a look what else we have here. So, um, no more questions, it says. Um, it, for some reason, I don't see the previous um, question anymore for Wiener. Ah, here it is. Okay, I'll get back to that in a second. I'm just going to switch um, to the slides now. Let's see. Um, one more question. Let's have a look at that first, whether I still need this slide set. All right. Ah, it's just a copy of the same um, question. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. Um, now for the update. Okay, here we go. So, um, 
let's hide the question slide for the moment and get back to the um, exercises. So welcome to this part now for those who have questions for the exercises. Um, so the first question was, I think already for the first, um, for the first uh, task here, namely Venus attack on RSA. But before we look at the detail, I would like to get a bit of a better understanding about how much um, you have already solved of this task. So what I'd be wondering about is, how far along is your team for each of these tasks? Have you not even started yet? Are you some parts done, but some parts unsolved? Or are you completely done with this task already? Cool, the first news are very good. So some people are apparently already completely done. And generally it looks that at least the people who are here are already quite far progressed. So it seems like Venus attack is, has the highest uh, solution rate already, but even the others are already quite far. So this is great news. Um, so 3.7, 3.2 and 2.8 are your um, self estimates. That's great. Um, what I was also wondering about is um, what the main points were so far that you had troubles with. So which were the aspects in, the, in these tasks where you had to do your own research or you didn't understand the slides or you got stuck somewhere? And whether you have any specific hints for the other teams that haven't finished solving yet. Okay, so the format handling of the um, files that we have for the RSA was apparently a particular problem. This is also something that the question we saw before relates to. Um, yeah, also importing the E and N from the PEM file. Okay, so it looks like file I.O. Um, is, as it unfortunately is so often, one of the hardest parts about crypto. Let's see if there are any other points or if there are hints from those who have already solved it, how to do this. Okay, there is a hint for you, uh, namely that uh, task three is suitable for uh, multi-threading and can speed up things significantly. Um, Maybe the person who said this wants to join Discord later and can give some more detailed hints to people how this works. Um, so my comments here, um, if you are patient, it shouldn't be necessary to it, but your solution will be a lot faster indeed if you do it. So uh, in particular, the first part where you are collecting relations um, can be more or less parallelized trivially. So you still need to collect the results in some way, of course, but you can spread this to as many cores as you like, more or less. Let's see if there's anything else. Otherwise, we can return to this um, a bit later if you have um, to see if, if you come up with any more things. Let's see what we have here. Continued fractions. Sage ran into a problem with certain numbers for us. Um, yeah, this might depend a bit on how you've um, implemented the continued fraction stuff. Let's have a look at it when we get there. So this happens in particular if you try to work um, with uh, doubles or reals instead of with pairs of integers. Um, so to keep this working, um, it's a lot better to work with integer values. And in particular, there are um, specialized version of continued fractions, which are specifically for um, the continued fractions of square roots of numbers. What else do we have here? Dealing with large numbers. Um, I'm not sure here if this is a general comment for um, large numbers in the sense that it takes a long while, while to do things or things get imprecise, or whether that's the specific challenge of treating large integers. So 
If you do this in something like Sage, you shouldn't have a problem because you can use arbitrarily large numbers there, no problem. But if you use something like C, you will want to use a library um, for big integers. And uh, I think we had a recommendation for this in the announcement um, slides, but I can have a look at that again. So if it's about um, dealing with integers bigger than 64 bits in general, then the answer is please, please, please find a good um, big integer library to do things. And um, it might also mean that you need to manually implement some algorithms if your integer library um, doesn't support it. This shouldn't be much of a problem in Sage, but in other things. Um, okay, um, looks like that's your input for now. So then I would suggest I go into the detailed description of the tasks, then show the earlier um, um, question um, again. And um, then once we run out of general questions, we can switch to Discord. Regarding the large numbers, um, you start in Python and then translate to Sage. Uh, this is a bit dangerous um, because Python does not support big integers and Sage does. So if you want to define your, uh, your um, integer, um, it doesn't work properly if you create it as a Python, um, or not all functions work if you create it as a Python integer. Um, so there is a separate Sage integer class. If you run your program using Python, um, you may need to use uh, this um, Sage integer class in order to have a proper representation of your number that supports all the big integer functions in Sage because the regular Python numbers do not support all of these functions. So this might be something to look out for. Um, if you do have um, Sage installed locally, it might be easier to just um, run your script using Sage, my file name, instead of Python, my file name. The two are more or less interchangeable if the versions are, um, are uh, compatible. Okay, um, it looks like this was the last uh, comment for the moment. So let's have a look at the detailed tasks. So the first one is um, Wiener's attack on RSA, which is um, an attack that works in special um, situations if the private exponent has some properties. And here this task um, consisted of two subtasks the first is one that was already mentioned in one of the questions, namely, you need to compute the nth convergence of um, the continued fraction expansion of a number. And uh, this is potentially where some of you ran into, um, ran into problems. If um, you're trying to represent the formulas that are given on the slides with something like reals or doubles instead of rational numbers or pair of integers. So if you define these things in, um, in uh, Sage, you can get, um, there is actually a class for rational numbers, which consists of two integers. Or what you can also do is you can separately handle the, um, the numerator and the denominator of the continued fraction expansion and update both according to the recursion rules that are given on the slides. And the second task here is one that was also already mentioned now as a source of problems. Namely, you're supposed to apply your, um, your tool to an actual RSA public key um, that is given in this PEM format, and you're supposed to uh, decrypt the corresponding message. And it looks like some of the tasks originate, or some of the problems originated here. So um, here's again the example that we also um, saw on the announcement of the, of the exercises, um, where you can see um, an example that you should use as a test case um, for your implementation or that you can use as a test case. Um, but let's now switch to the uh, questions. Um, let's see. So the question was, you already implemented the attack, but what's missing is the application to the given um, ciphertext. So you're not sure how to get the 
public N and the provided um, uh, E in the from the file that you're given. How do you do this? Um, this is a question that lacking code, I cannot directly um, answer here. Um, but the easiest strategy is to um, try and find um, to Google for it essentially. I'm just thinking whether we didn't have some example codes for this in one of the challenges in cryptography. I will need to check that whether you can um, take it from there. Um, but otherwise, um, what you can use for this is, um, so there are some, um, some hints how you can um, use, I think, OpenSSL file to solve this, or you look up um, any uh, libraries that do this for you. Um, I think this is a question that we should move to, to Discord later and I can have a look at that and also open my own um, or our own uh, reference implementation there so that you can um, compare with this. But the short answer is it's easiest to use some uh, existing implementation that supports this file format. And um, there's a related question um, that it um, that extracting apparently uh, worked. So maybe uh, some of you also want to share how you parse the uh, PEM file, um, but you're running into uh, problems before reaching the limit. So this is something um, that might be related to um, to the representation of numbers that you use. I'm not sure what sort of uh, limit you're speaking about here, this could be um, an integer size limit, it could be a precision limit if you're using um, reals or doubles or something like that. Um, I don't know if the limit is something you impose yourself as an upper limit of some of the numbers, so I'm not sure how exactly um, to address this here. But if you're only using uh, integers, um, then my, my suggestion would be to extend whatever limit you're talking about here. Um, also, if you're implementing this recursively or so, you might also want to rewrite this, uh, for example, as a loop if the recursion limit um, should be a problem. So I'm not sure how exactly you're solving it and what your limit is, but these are some pointers that might um, help. Um, Another question related to Wiener's attack. In the example, it says um, you test for, um, if you have a candidate, uh, like D equals 569, you test whether it works with some M. What is meant by M and where do you find this? M is a message and you can essentially use any message that you like here. So well, what I mean by this is that you do a trial encryption and the trial decryption with your secret exponent. So the nice thing is that you do have the public exponent. Uh, this is given together with n um, in the public key. And you can now use any message that you like, encrypt it on your own with this public exponent, and then try to decrypt it with the candidate number that you got. If the decryption is successful and you get your message again, then you have found the right um, value D. If it gives something different, then D was not the correct value. So in other words, D was not the inverse of the given E. And so what you essentially do is you implement, you encrypt your own message and you trial decrypt it. And that's the verification that you use for the message. Okay, here is a recommendation um, for importing the key. And this is the uh, tool that was already uh, what some people used um, during the cryptography exercises last year, namely the Pi CryptoDome uh, library, uh, which you can use in Python and which sorts, uh, supports all kinds of useful things in interacting with files and standards. So thanks a lot for whoever recommended this. Um, and here's also an answer to the uh, limit question I was asking. The limit you are talking about is the one third times uh, square root four of n limit. Ah, okay. So your point is that um, you only tested these up to the um, up to this uh, limit here. And the thing about this limit is this is 
um, a sufficient prerequisite, if this bound holds, then the attack works. The attack might also works might also work for some numbers that are larger than this. And actually, I don't know by heart whether the given number is below or above this bound. So in that case, uh, definitely go for larger numbers um, or allow larger numbers. It might be that the exponent is actually larger and the attack still works. Um, I can check that a bit later offline, uh, whether it's above or below this bound. So whether um, um, <clears throat> you have some other bug somewhere else, this is possible. I don't know that, um, but you can definitely try increasing this bound. Okay, um, while there are no questions popping up at the moment, um, I want to jump to the next task in the meantime. So let's have a look at the Bleichenbacher padding oracle. And um, I need to hide the Q&A, thank you. So um, what's the task here? This is again an attack on RSA, but this time it's about the padding. So the task here was um, divided into three subtasks. The first one is to um, implement or find an implementation of RSA that you can use for your attack. So in other words, you need an implementation of this padding oracle, which consists of padding any message you want to encrypt with this um, byte string here, plus a couple of random bytes, plus a zero byte, and then the actual message. So implementing um, this padding scheme um, to, be, to use as, for the, as a basis for the rest is already the first and hopefully very easy task. The second task is where it starts to get interesting, where you actually need to um, implement the attack ingredients. And here the first thing to do is to implement a solver for this lattice problem, the closest vector, pro uh, yeah, closest vector problem, which given a lattice and the point gives you the closest lattice point to this target point. And for this, you will need two ingredients. One you should implement yourself and the other one you can use any existing implementation of. So the existing implementation um, is what you can do for the LLL algorithm. This is the lattice basis reduction algorithm. So this is a sort of pre-processing step. And there are libraries of this um, for most, um, most major, um, mo most major uh, programming languages or contexts. So in particular, there is an inbuilt implementation in Sage. And I think we put a reference to um, C um, implementation on the last slides. Um, this will simply transform your basis to a better basis. What you will then have to implement is the Babai technique from lecture number four, which simply consists in solving a linear equation system and rounding the result. And um, for the last step, um, you combine these two uh, parts and implement it or apply it to an actual target. So here is a, just a copy of the slides from the lecture of how this works in case we need it for explaining any of the questions. Um, let's see if there's anything important in the hints here that I should say again. Um, but I guess that's fine. So find an existing implementation, for example the one in Sage, and um, find a way to solve integer equations. Uh, Sage can do that by itself. Um, but it's also easy to find implementations for C, for example. And again, it's best to test for small numbers first. So for example, for the challenge numbers, like we, um, uh, like very tiny challenge numbers, I think there are none in the lecture, um, but you can, um, if you have the oracle that you implemented in the first step, then you can, um, can use that here already. And, um, for very small bits, uh, the advantage is, of course, it's faster and you get intermediate results fast. Okay, um, let's see if there are any questions on this. 
Um, if there are some detailed implementation questions on this, you can also direct, directly contact uh, Markus, who did the reference implementation for this. Let's see if there are any questions for the moment. Nothing as of yet. Okay, then let's have a look at the last task in the meantime. Um, for those who haven't started yet, this was uh, about factoring, um, namely about factoring algorithm based on the idea of factor bases and sieving. And here the intermediate subtasks are essentially um, relate, um, relate to the different steps of the attack. But before I go into the details, it looks like there is a question on the previous task. Let's see. Some RSA PKC implementations also check if there is a zero byte separating the padding and the message, which is more restrictive than we need. Is this correct? Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, some error detectors uh, check only the first two bytes, the 0002, and some also check that there is at least one zero byte somewhere in the rest of the message. Um, this is indeed more restrictive as you need uh, than you need for your task. It doesn't matter whether you do this check or not, because the information you exploit is only about the first two bytes. So it's actually completely irrelevant um, whether the rest of the padding is correct or no. Both variants are fine for the sake of the exercises. Um, the thing is also the rest of the message um, is usually relatively long. So even for random messages, there is a relatively good chance that there randomly is some zero byte somewhere. Um, yeah. So this doesn't make much of a difference for the performance of the attack. If you implement the stricter rule, where you also check for the zero byte, then the effect might be that you get a bit fewer results um, from the query, because in some cases, um, the values will be rejected, um, but that doesn't make that much of a difference for the overall runtime of your attack. So however you do it, it's fine. And it might be a bit more efficient if you do an oracle that doesn't do this check. Okay. Then um, let's continue with uh, the subtasks of the factoring algorithm here. Uh, so the first one here is um, to implement the first part that you need for factoring with factor bases. And this is to collect square numbers. So to collect squares, you, which you can factor modulo um, the numbers that you need. And the second step, um, so th this first step is one that you can um, parallelize very easily as somebody else mentioned earlier, which can speed up the whole thing. Because then you can easily search in parallel for these squares. Um, in the second part, um, you take all the squares that you've collected in the first part and try to combine this information, which will involve solving a linear equation system. Uh, this time a linear equation system over bits, so over the finite field with two elements. Um, you can either implement this very easily by yourself. So if you encode it simply that um, one line of the matrix with n bits is a some n bit integer, um, then you can implement something like Gaussian elimination, which simply consists in XORing some of these um, uh, bit strings to each other. Might get a bit more complicated or you might need larger bit vectors if you have, if you work with larger numbers. But in essence, it's very easy. You can, however, also directly use some um, computer algebra systems for this. So for example, um, in Sage, you can define that if you define a matrix with zeros and one, you can say this is a matrix over bits, so over GF2. And if you do that, then all the things like inverting or solving an equation with this matrix will also be done in the correct field. Um, 
it essentially depends on your preferences which of the two you find easier to do. In the third step here, you take this basic approach, which just um, takes any random numbers for squares or searches all values of an interval for squares, with this more clever trick that we had in quadratic sieving, um, <clears throat> which means that you're looking a bit more strategically for the numbers that you test here. And in particular, you also do a lot fewer trial divisions. So here you will have to take each square that you get and try to factor it by dividing it through all the prime numbers in your basis, in your factor base. Whereas here, you're going to implement this selectively. This also might mean that you need to restructure the loops um, that you use here a bit um, to make this easier. And uh, finally, in the end, uh, by the way, this, um, depending on how you do it, it might also be harder or easier to parallelize. Depends a bit on your choices. And the last task is to, um, to apply this algorithm to a relatively large number n, namely a 100-bit number, which will run a while uh, depending on your choices. Um, but uh, yeah, should still finish in reasonably time. Um, okay, here's another question. However, it's also for the previous task, so I'm again going back. On task two, what you understand in the third subtask is that you have to try different C's until you get valid ones um, per byte in the message. But each has a probability of 2 to the minus 16. Is it too complex um, or whether you under misunderstood that? So let's jump back to task number um, three here. Uh, task number three was um, combining these two ingredients and running the attack. Let's have a look at the example to um, address your question. Um, so what you do in this uh, second step is indeed, as you hint, you try different C's until you get valid ones. Yes, so this part is correct. Um, what you do is you take the challenge message, uh, the challenge cipher text C, you choose some random values S and multiply the C with S to the power of E to get the C prime. That's exactly what you describe. And then you check whether this is a valid padded um, message. That's also what you describe. And this is also correct. And indeed, this is correct with a probability of 2 to the minus 16. Because what you will get is you multiply a valid padded message with some random number, which will give you another random number of the same length. And if this random number by accident starts with 0002, then it's a valid padded message and the oracle or uh, whatever you um, implement as the checking method will accept this ciphertext and you keep it. Um, so I think so far you understood that all correct. And what you then do is with all the um, C primes that you keep is you put them into this, um, into this lattice basis here. So you will take the values S that you used for your valid ciphertexts and put them all as one basis vector of your lattice. So the first basis vector is going to be 2 to the minus 16 and all these random s's that you used, and the other rows are all going to be 0 and 0, 0, 0. So in a diagonal shape here. This is what you use from the, um, from the messages that you successfully kept. And what you also need is this constant target vector. You need to create that. Um, but this simply consists of, um, so essentially what 0.5a means is a value of the correct size, so the same size as n, that starts with 0001, because a is here a short notation for 0002. So anything that starts with 0001, um, and then many zeros goes into here. And here you have 2.5 times a. a is again the 0002 blah blah blah. Uh, so 2.5 this is 0002, 8, 0, 0, 0, 0. 
Um, so these are the constants you plug in there and the length of these constants are exactly the same lengths that you also use for your um, ciphertext. So this is the bit length of n. For example, if you have a um, 2048-bit modulus, then all these values are going to be 2048 bits long and start with 0001, all zeros, 00028, uh, and then all zeros, and the rest also copies of the same number. So you build up this and this with all the messages that you kept and throw it into your Barbai algorithm from the first step. And you will get a result, a resulting lattice vector. And if everything goes well, then this is the vector that you're going to get. It will have the correct plain text times 2 to the minus 16 in the first entry and the um, fake messages that would correspond to your fake ciphertexts in all of the other ones. Um, since you don't actually know these values, you cannot ver really verify it, but you can verify this first part here. In particular, you can read M out from it. So um, I hope this addressed your question. It seems to me that you understood everything correctly. What I'm not sure about in your question, if I show that again, um, is what you mean by until you get a valid one per byte in the message. I'm not sure what this means. So what you do is you simply test if your resulting ciphertexts start with um, um, start in the uh, decrypted version with 0002. That's everything you test. Okay. Let's get back to the um, to the factoring based uh, task here. So maybe let's have a brief look at the running example here um, to recall the individual steps that you have to implement here. Um, the first step is to choose a size for your factor basis. So this is, you choose the first few prime numbers up to some bound. Um, to see how many you have to choose here, for toy examples you can just choose as you like. For larger numbers, it's um, recommended or it's a starting point that you work with the sizes given on the um, assignment sheet. So there is some um, bound recommendation um, which generally works reasonably well for large numbers but you might have to uh, increase the size a bit as well. So here you might have to try a bit around um, how large your factor base needs to be for this to work out. What you then do is, um, for the subtask number three, um, is, uh, so when you implement the quadratic sieve, um, you will need to find um, these alphas, which um, describe the, uh, the pattern in which you're searching for the right squares. And to do this, you would first have to solve some quadratic equations. So uh, what you're going to solve is, um, the quadratic equation, um, some unknown squared is equivalent to your number n modulo all of the prime numbers in your um, vector base. So in the first case, um, your alpha squared is supposed to be equal to this number, which is the same as 1 modulo 2, and the equation is also supposed to hold modulo 2. So if you're looking for any number that is um, for any alpha that is equivalent to 1 modulo 2 and the solution is very simple well 1 squared equals 1 modulo 2 so plus or minus 1 are your solutions plus and minus 1 are actually the same thing modulo 2 so it's just plus 1. Um, yeah so this means that you look um, at all the numbers that are equivalent to mon 1 modulo 2 and use them as a basis of your um, factoring. For the next case here you're looking for um, alphas which are equal to uh, this which is 0 modulo 3 modulo 3. What 0 modulo 3? Well 0 squared equals 0 modulo 3. So you're looking at multiples of 3 here. 
um, as candidates. So only these numbers or the squares corresponding to these numbers will have to be divided uh, in the trial division by 3. And the same for 5 and so on. Now the maybe challenging part here is how you solve these quadratic equations. And um, here, um, again, if you're using a computer algebra system or a good big integer library, it might already be able to solve this. So you're looking for an algorithm that computes a square root modulo a prime number, namely the square root of 8, for example, modulo 11. Because alpha squared equals 8 means alpha is the square root of 8. And if your library doesn't implement uh, anything like that, you can also um, implement it yourself. This is the so-called tonelli shanks algorithm. This is not really complicated. It's just a couple of um, loops and evaluating of, of functions. So um, I think this should be a clickable link. I'm not sure if it's not. Just ask Wikipedia about it. It should have a ready-made um, algorithm that you can use as a basis for your implementation. But you can also use any library function for that. Um, okay, so that's the first step. Um, after you've found all of these square roots here and you know which numbers to check, you do the actual checking. So for each of the um, alphas here in a certain interval, so in the interval around square root of n, you look, so you first compute the um, the number b, which is uh, a squared minus n, and you try to factor this modulo the factor base. Um, but this, as I said already, doesn't mean that you do a trial division of each of these numbers by each prime number, but only the ones that we saw on the previous slide. So for example, for trial division by 2, you only do trial division of those numbers where the a was equivalent to 1 modulo 2. So every second one here. And for trial division by 3, you only do trial division by those who are um, equivalent to 0 modulo 3 or just a multiple of 3, uh, which is this, 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 and so on. And those are exactly the ones that are divisible by that number. And at the very end, um, you also need to include minus 1 in your factor base because some of these numbers are negative. Um, so at the end, you um, need to do a division by those. And for all the numbers where, as a result, you have a value of 1, this means the number was completely factorizable with respect to your factor base. And it means you can use it in the next step. So these are the relations you want to collect, or the squares you want to collect. So this is the b, which is an a squared modulo n, and you have factored it. These ones you collect, so here and here and here and here, and write them down into your equation system. So what you actually write down is just the exponents that you have here modulo 2, because you only care about whether the exponent is even or odd, and you want to find a combination of some of these columns here, such that if you x or the corresponding vectors here, you get a zero as a result. Or in other words, you find squares so that when you multiply them together, you have in total even exponents for every prime factor. For example, if you combine these two, um, you have an odd and an odd exponent for two, but if you multiply them together, you get an even exponent because you sum the exponents. Here, the combination is not yet correct because it combines to an odd exponent, so you would need to add, for example, this column here, and so on. And you can do this either in the stupid trial combination way that I just explained, or you see that this corresponds to solving a linear equation system because you want either 0 or 1 times this vector, plus 0 or 1 times this vector, plus 0 or 1 times this vector, and the result should be 0. So what you actually want to do is, if you read out this matrix here, you want to find the null space of the matrix, or the kernel of the matrix. Um, these are keywords. If you look them up in Sage or so, they do exactly what you want to do in this step here. Or you could try to implement it yourself. Um, it's not efficient enough if you really try to combine every possible combinations of vectors here. So if you um, have n such columns here, 
when there are two to the n possible combinations of them. If n is too large, this is too much. So please don't try all possible combinations, but do proper linear, linear algebra. So proper equation solving. And once you have found this combination, it's just a matter of multiplying up the result and hoping for the best, because it might still go wrong. If you're lucky, your result um, yields a factor of n here. If you're unlucky, it doesn't. Okay, let's have a look at the question. There's one more for the first task. Let's go back. Here we have the tag, and the question is the following. Um, so you get an exponent in a certain um, format, which is simply given as the bytes. Can this be converted to integer in Sage? Um, yes, it can be. There are many ways of how to do this. Um, generally speaking, um, the integer class in Sage can import. Um, so if you have this given as a string, um, it can uh, import numbers from strings. For this, you need to give it the string and the basis of the string. So the basis of hexadecimal numbers is 16. So if you give it that, it should convert it automatically. You will probably have to remove the, um, the columns for this to work, but this could be the easiest. Um, alternatively, you can also do this manually, um, just like you would do it in uh, C or any other language. But the easiest is probably to use this um, import function that converts a string with a certain basis to, a, to an integer in Sage. And this should be one of the constructor functions of the integer class. You can also Google for this very easily if you um, yeah, search for hexadecimal to Sage integer or something, you should find many ready-made solutions. Um, Okay, um, I hope that's solved with this. And there are no more number, numbers um, or questions at the moment. So I would briefly go back um, to the uh, tip slide we had earlier um, to see if there are any more hints that you have for each other. Um, it appears that Menti is stuck again. It's not very stable today, apparently. Ah, well, um, it looks like that part uh, died a bit. Ah, here we are. And there actually appears to be a new entry here. So let me have a look. Um, okay, so you managed to get the modulus. It looks like blah. How can it be converted to an integer? Uh, is this a hex representation? Um, I think I just answered that. Yet, yes, this is a hex representation, and yes, you can easily um, convert it. And probably the easiest is to remove the columns in between and parse it into the integer class. Um, you should uh, check that it has the correct length in order to be sure that you're reading the correct value. Um, but otherwise, this should be very easy to convert. Okay. Um, I'll wait a couple more seconds to see if some questions pop up and otherwise I would switch to Discord in case you have any um, uh, more personal questions and I think Marcus is also available there. If he's not there at the moment, then um, he will read your message very soon. Okay, let's have some more cats time in the meantime while we're waiting. And, oh, there is something already that was fast. Let's see. Ah, thanks for the great lecture. Uh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> thanks also for participating and also actually asking questions. Okay, I take this as a signal that there are no more uh, exercise questions at the moment. Um, if you change your mind, I'll be on Discord. See you there in a moment. Otherwise, um, have a great evening and all the best for next week. Thanks a lot for staying with us so long and bye.